us as a, as a country, and it's incumbent upon the movement to make sure that we continue to put political pressure on our representatives to correct the issue of income inequality. Thank you. So we have a few minutes for questions, and um, I'm going to reserve the right to have the last question because I have a burning one for the end. But um, let's take a couple we're questions. We're going to march for food. Or what? We're going to march for food. That's why, like, we're the last thing standing between you and food, so this won't be a long time. Um, but I, uh, my colleague in the front uh, had his hand up first. My name is Klaus Volk. I have two short questions uh, to Kailash Satyaki. Uh, could you shortly outline for our international guests uh, dimensions of child labor in India and uh, it was mentioned that you have liberated 85,000 children from child labor. Uh, are you happy in relations to the funds invested overall and, uh, and uh, perhaps also to mention uh, your pedagogical concept uh, for the rehabilitation. And 20 years back, you told me uh, that you are considering to source funds from within Indian society. Has this really happened? Or is it still primarily outside driven? And last but not least, do you agree that the issue of child labor besides certain days is not anymore a public topic in this society? Um, Kailash, if it's okay, why don't we take maybe t one more yeah. question and then we'll handle them together. There was, so there was not one question, there were six or seven <laughs> questions. <laughs> that was six. I, right. And um, at this point, we'll ha ask you to kindly keep it to like really one question. So my, my sister in the back, please. Um, hello, my name is Sabai Smile and I'm from Peshawar. Um, I run an organization called Aware Girls. Uh, my question is to Kailash is that uh, as, as he mentioned, as you mentioned as well, that children are being uh, used by the militant groups and religious extremist groups like Taliban in Pakistan as well. They are recruiting them and they are using them as suicide bombers. They are training them. So um, while I am working with young people and uh, trying to uh, counteract religious extremism, but I'm engaging young people. So what can uh, civil society play a role uh, to uh, uh, like prevent children to join these militant ranks to the militant groups like Taliban. According to like your experience, what uh, civil society can play, like uh, what strategies can uh, be developed by the civil society? Are you both comfortable with one more question and then we'll answer the three? All right, we'll take one more um, from uh, someone who hasn't, uh, in, the, in the very back in the blue shirt, please. My name is uh, Lucia. <laughs> My name is uh, Sukhjan Sample, and uh, I'm with uh, Tibet uh, Policy Institute, uh, the State Center of the Central Tibetan Administration based in Dhamsala. And my uh, question is to Mr. Kalash Satati. Uh, one of uh, your uh, Nobel laureates uh, is in prison uh, in China. So within the Nobel laureate community, is there any movement to get him free? Okay. So um, nobody can say with authority that how many children working as child laborers in India, because the uh, statistics go from uh, something like uh, 5 million, according to government of India, to 22 million UNICEF, to 50 or more than 50 million according to NGOs. So it's a long range. But one thing is very clear, the NGOs as well as the government agrees on one trend that there's a decline, not very sharp decline, the decline of child laborers in many sectors. Carpet industry where we uh, know uh, has been one of them. Uh, the number of uh, child laborers in South Asian carpet ind industry, according to uh, one of the DOL, Department of Labor of United States study, was uh, one million in mid 
or late 80, uh, 90s. And that has definitely gone down significantly to hardly 300,000 about uh, five years ago, six years ago. But now, other studies prove that they are no more than 200,000. So at least 800,000 children were benefited, or more maybe, because there could have been more children. But most significant is that since the volume of carpet production and export did not go down, uh, these children are replaced by the able-bodied adults of that area. So this whole campaign has led to the creation of jobs for 800,000 people in place of those children. And that is the hidden but the most significant outcome of this. Uh, rehabilitation is still a big question mark. Uh, if these children are freed under bonded labor law, which at least I do and my organization in India tries to do, to liberate every single child under bonded labor law so that they become entitled for the rehabilitation benefits under various government schemes. If they are freed under child labor law, a 20,000 rupees fine is to be imposed. In some cases, it is collected. In many cases, not. We also fight for the back wages for those children. And millions of rupees have been recovered as back wages in case of children in Delhi territory. Because Delhi High Court has given a very good order uh, in, in, in my petition. So it has been quite uh, encouraging response in terms of the recovery of the back wages and uh, other things. Then um, uh, as far as the money is concerned, uh, frankly speaking, we have not been able to mobilize resources within India. 20 years ago, we had this vision. Now we also have this vision after the Nobel Peace Prize. <laughs> but in last four months, nobody has given us money. <laughs> Everybody was talking, Kailashji, you should have become so wealthy now. Money should not be the question. You have a Nobel Prize. And let me tell you, Savana, that the money which has been given, some uh, uh, quite a good amount of money from the Nobel Peace Prize, um, I made an announcement that this money will not come to me or my family. We will not spend that money. It will not go to uh, my organization, Bachpan Bachao Andolan or Global March in India. It would, it would be spent on the children directly and the most needy organizations who will work for policy changes and for practical activities on the ground. So the money is still lying with the Nobel Committee. And the medal, I said that this is not medal just for me. It is for every single citizen of India. So I've handed over this medal to, to the people of India through the president. So the medal, medal has been given to the president. So neither I have money nor medal. <laughs> so, <laughs> and, and it is not that I am a saint. <laughs> I, am very, I am very smart in that. <laughs> And I thought that if I keep the medal and money with me, everybody will ask, Kailash, this child labor, what are you doing? Here is child labor, what are you doing? <laughs> they still do. But then I say, now I say, that no, the, I'm not having the medal or the money, so I'm not a Nobel laureate in that sense. You all are Nobel laureate because the medal is with the people. It has been already donated to the country, to the, to the president. So every Indian citizen is responsible for that. Uh, so, <laughs> it is like that. <laughs> uh, then the uh, second question of, about the civil society. Civil society has to play a very important role because uh, in our entire education system, we have not been able to inculcate the values of human dignity and democracy, which we are talking today. Uh, but more importantly, the values of uh, mutual respect uh, and tolerance. I see that the trend globally that the young people are getting more and more intolerant. Sometimes the elderly people say that, oh, these people are intolerant because of so many things, but it is an intergeneration or the generation gap issue. It's not generation gap issue. I've never seen in the history that so many youth are getting so intolerant and eventually violent and if we are not able to address this problem of intolerance, 
among youth, then it will become irreparable in the future when it becomes a, the, the, the big blast in, in, in violence. So I think as civil society organizations, we can demand our governments more systematically, more profoundly and strongly that the government should inculcate these things in education, these values. More importantly, the value of tolerance. Secondly, we should demand that education has to be free, compulsory, meaningful, quality, inclusive, equitable, and rational education. So if we compromise on education system and allow irrational education to continue, of course, the, the religious values and religions have their importance. But it should not be at the cost of uh, the rational and scientific thinking in the world. And fourthly, I would say that we should identify the young people, the civil society actors should identify the young leaders, and they should give them voices. They should become their own champions for tolerance, dignity, democracy, peace, for those things. So I think we should try to inculcate and we should try to encourage the young leadership around us. And instead of we, all the time speaking on behalf of uh, young people and children, let the young people take the driving seat and prove their leadership. And it is possible. Uh, the last question is about uh, the China. Uh, we are definitely, I'm working with a number of Nobel laureates. Uh, and some of those issues which I'm receiving, and one of these issues is this, um, I will definitely be talking with the rest of the Nobel laureate, not only with the peace laureates, but other laureates about all the issues related to children, basically, that is core in my heart, but also, um, also such kind of denial of freedom and democracy anywhere in the world. So the good news is that um, Kailash is going to stay for dinner. So um, we've gone over time. So I'm going to make a suggestion, which is that um, I'm going to ask my very quick last question. We'll break. And um, if you'd like to discuss further with the panelists, they're both here for the evening. So my last question is, uh, we've talked about really intractable problems. We've talked about child labor. We've talked about you know gender discrimination, racial and ethnic bias, um, lack of democracy and human rights. These are really intractable looking problems in the world. But not a person in this room would do any of the jobs anyone did if we believed that that's truly intractable, that we couldn't make these changes. Every single person in this room uh, does our work every single day based on a sense of optimism, a sense of hope, and a sense of uh, you know, working together in our networks, in our own countries, that we actually can make these changes no matter how long it takes. And so I want to ask both of you just quickly before dinner, what gives you hope uh, that, that, that we'll be successful in this march for dignity and democracy around the world? Well, the thing that gives me hope is our young people. I uh, think whenever people come together and refuse to accept their current situation and strive, or to better themselves and better their communities and society, then that, then that has to give us hope. And I think what we are seeing is uh, young people, this millennial generation, that really has refused to accept what uh, this world has placed upon them. I mean, they were the hardest victims of the global economic crash in 2008. But I see young people coming together through social media, coming together by forums like this, coming together by wishing for a better planet, a more environmental free planet, and a much better planet in which they could raise their families and participate in society as a whole by having affordable work, by having the opportunity to raise a family with dignity and respect and educate their children. And young people are serious about these goals and objectives. And I'm like Kailash. Um, I'm like Kailash. I think that we ought to give them some space, let them figure it out, and uh, I am confident that they will, and they will carry the fight forward. Um, I more than agree with Fred. He's absolutely right. Actually, this is very important. Uh, for me also, I work with the children and youth for so many years uh, in India and across 100 countries. Um, and I know that young people are rising up. 
Taiwanese, for instance. Uh, let, me, let me correct you that earlier I loved Taiwan because of my children, but now after visiting with you, Mr. Ambassador, and your wife, wonderful, and other friends, um, I love Taiwan because I have a lot of brothers and sisters there beside my children. So, <laughs> so it is there. But anyway, there are young people in India, for instance. I work in Rajasthan, I work in Jharkhand and other places which are very remote areas. The girls are refusing to marry at early age. They are saying no to it. And that is remarkable. The girls and boys both across the country, especially the girls, the adults and girls, they are going to the police and complaining the cases against sexual abuse if it is happening in their family, in the neighborhood, in the schools. Otherwise, five years ago, or maybe three years ago, they were not rising up. They were, not, they were living in silence because of the social taboo and because of the suppression and oppression by the families, all kind of uh, social and uh, cultural uh, issues. But now they are breaking the silence. That's very, very significant. The girls and boys in Nigeria, in, uh, in Ethiopia, the poor countries, in Bangladesh, in Pakistan, I go there and I talk to them. In Mexico, in Peru, they are demanding good quality education. Not simply education, they are asking for good quality education. They are they are raising the voices that they school, in the schools teacher, uh, teachers are not coming sometimes, or the syllabus books are not proper, or the school environment is not good. This voice, these voices are coming from the children and youth. And these things give us tremendous hope. They are, as I said, that the children are our, the reflection of our past, the proof of our present, and the indication of our future. So, I, I know that whatever mistakes we have done, our young people are not going to tolerate it. And their anger for good, <laughs> the anger for good is, is quite remarkable and it's very, very promising and I trust it. Thank you. So join me in saying thank you to Kailash Satyarthi and Fred Redman and it's time for dinner and discussion. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.